ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first session this morning, which will be devoted to questions of climate and energy. Um, I have to admit that if we lived in a perfect world, free from the COVID pandemic, uh, the five of us would be sitting today here on the stage. Most probably in this perfect world, uh, we would be greeting ourselves on the great achievements in terms of decarbonization of our economies, uh, in terms of development of our societies, in terms of uh, perfect quality of our perfect lives, of course, in harmony with nature. However, today, on the 16th of September 2021, the reality is quite different. Uh, the Polish representation in this panel uh, has been unfortunately reduced by one person. The British team connects with us remotely. Instead of greeting ourselves, uh, we are all, as humanity, receiving heavy criticism from the scientists from the IPCC panel. Conclusions from their latest report uh, can be interpreted in only one way. We are facing a global climate catastrophe. And we know it. Yesterday, during the opening of this forum, practically every speaker uh, was referring to the issue of climate change, saying that this is one of the most important challenges of our time. In Poland, climate change and the need for energy transition have finally gained the necessary political importance. Also, business, civil society, even basic households have become aware of benefits resulting from better care for our planet. COP24, held in 2018 in Katowice, largely contribu contributed to such a change of attitudes in Poland. What is even more impor important, COP24 in Katowice resulted in the adoption of the so-called Katowice Rulebook. This climate package sets out the essential procedures and mechanisms that make the Paris Agreement operational. In Britain, climate change is also an extremely hot topic due to the upcoming November uh, COP26 conference in Glasgow. The expectations towards this conference are also extremely high, I would say even bigger than in Katowice a few years ago. But the fight against climate change shouldn't just mean the need for creation of new documents. Also, it is not a matter of fiercely defending one's national interests. It is not an expectation that in Glasgow we will find one best solution for the climate change problems. Let's be frank, with over 200, almost, sorry, uh, 200 parties to the Paris Agreement, uh, there is no one-size-fits-all solution to climate problems. You can disagree, but for me, the fight against climate change is about doing our best, here and now, where we, wherever we are in our professional and personal lives. It is about taking responsibility for ourselves, for the others, for today and for tomorrow. But how you define doing our best is another issue. And this is the topic of our today's morning bilateral exchange. We will discuss the Polish and British paths toward low carbon future, green post-COVID recovery, and possible outcomes of the COP26. And I am pretty sure that our debate will be very meaningful because we've got a fantastic team of experts with us today. Um, I will start with uh, Juliet Davenport in order of appearance with introductory remarks that will follow. Uh, Julian is... Uh, uh, Juliet, sorry, a founder of Good Energy, one of the biggest companies in the UK uh, in the renewable energy sector. And this is also a person who is empowering people to be part of the solution to climate change. And this empowerment is at the core of all her activities uh, as advisor, as innovator, as expert, as lecturer, and in all the other functions that she holds. Uh, Honorata Negaukaszewska, on my left hand, uh, present here in Warsaw, is a lecturer of uh, the Warsaw School of Economics. She specializes in energy security issues, uh, international economics, but also energy environment conflicts, which might be of high relevance for today's discussion. Uh, she also uh, uh, has experience in the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs in Poland and also worked in, uh, uh, during COP14. Uh, 
Anthony Frogat, uh, our second British speaker, is a Deputy Director and Senior Research Fellow uh, in the Environment and Society Programme in Chatham House. Uh, he has worked as an independent consultant for, for a number of years, and I am pretty sure we will have a chance to talk about his latest report that was published two days ago. Before we get started with the debate, uh, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, timing. Uh, we started on time and we will have to end on time. This means that we will have to stop at 10.45, our discussion. Uh, simply, I think that you don't want to miss the coffee break and the possibility to discuss all the outcomes of today's debate uh, on the corridors and, and, and uh, uh, drinking coffee. Uh, when it comes to the agenda of today's discussion, we will st start with uh, introductory remarks of, let's say, five to eight minutes by every uh, panelist. And uh, this will be followed by a session of questions and answers fro from the audience here in, in, uh, in the room and also through our live chat. So don't hesitate to ask questions. If ever you have any, I will get them and I will ask them also to our panelists if, if uh, there are some. So maybe let's simply hear from Juliet, then Honorata will follow, Anthony will be the last one to present his initial thoughts. Um, good morning and, and thank you for that introduction and um, thank you for inviting me to speak this morning on something that uh, for me has been my life's work, something I've been, I've been working around climate change and renewable energy for the last kind of 25 years. Um, so 25 years ago I was a climate scientist, I was interested in doing something practical and, and you mentioned going directly to consumers. Um, Consumers are the people who use energy. Uh, the way we consume energy fundamentally impacts on its, its, uh, our climate change, uh, climate change impacts. And when you go through that uh, sort of story of the UK, when I started Good Energy, had 2% renewables in the renewable energy mix, in the energy mix. We're now closer to 40, 45% renewables. And that journey has been a, a really interesting eye-opener. Um, and it's made, sort of allowed me to think through what are the key components that you need to have a transition and what, how fast can you transition? And I guess um, I think of it through five pillars. So the first pillar is what is a country doing on research and innovation and design? How are we thinking about the technologies that we're investing in for the next 10 years? Um, the next part is what does the infrastructure look like? Uh, most of the Western European countries or the European countries grew up in a world which was, uh, they grew their economies in a high carbon infrastructure world. So we have things like electricity networks that were built for centralized power stations. We have gas pipelines that deliver power, uh, gas to people's homes. Uh, and we have a transport system that was built up around using petrol and the internal combustion engine. So that infrastructure as well means that transitioning to a new world, you've got to think about how, does the, how do new technologies play into that into existing infrastructure. You've then got the regulatory and policy framework, which gives you the framework for financing renewables. Um, and that again, the UK has, uh, I think, 11,000 pages of regulation. As an innovative and new entrant into this market, it is, it is a minefield to try and find your way through. And I'm sure that is a similar challenge in other countries. Um, and then coming to consumers, uh, what, one of the things quite often in my early years in, in the renewable sector, um, people would always forget that they were generating power for somebody. Uh, so you, you don't just deliver power to the meter at somebody, outside somebody's house. Actually, going beyond the meter, understanding how they use that power when they use that power is incredibly important. And it's been the big forgotten part of the energy sector for years. And then finally, we have to think about what are the skills we're going to need to deliver this low carbon vision? We've basically created a workforce around high carbon. So whether that's in the UK and the, the oil and gas industry, uh, in, in other, well, Poland in the coal industry, how do we transition that workforce to support us to deliver this low carbon? And how do we make sure that that transition works really well? And I guess when you look at those five areas, 
Um, there are different speeds. A, a lot of the time when people talk about transition, they focus on policy. But if you just focus on policy and you don't have those other parts in place, then you can slow down the process. If you don't have consumers on board, then you don't have political will. If you don't have technologies coming through and design coming through that allows us to put technologies into people's homes, then, then you, you slow again with, with technologies that don't suit the end purpose. One of the things that came out uh, this year, two years ago, um, from the Climate Change Committee was their most recent report, which showed that the next steps for the UK particularly are going to be more difficult. We've done the easy stuff in a sense, that change on switching out technology led approach in the electricity and power markets to get to 40% renewables. Is, it's, not, it's not straightforward, but it's, it's, it's relatively large scale and you can do that. The next parts are going to be much difficult. We're going to have to deal with variability in power inputs so from wind and solar. We're also going to have to deal with the fact that we have to decarbonize heat in the UK. And that is going to need consumer input. And we're going to have to think through that. And then finally, on the transport side, Actually, what's fascinating about that is that the regulatory um, piece where essentially outlawing the internal combustion engine from 20, 2030 in the UK uh, and, and across Europe, has, have we seen this massive move? And, and that actually is where we've seen an improvement in the technology and consumer uptake. Where those two have come together, I think we'll see electric vehicle uptake really accelerate now for personal transport in the UK. But we still got to think about freight and we still got to think about um, sort of uh, how do we move large bulky things around and, and electricity is not necessarily the best way on that. So, so that's, that's how I see the vision in terms of each, not every country needs exactly the same blueprint, but those are the constituents parts. If we need to move at pace, which we do now, we need to start to think across the board um, not just in policy area, but across those five areas to really shift any country at speed. Thank you very much. Honorata, your turn. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting. Um, I'm very happy, Julia, that you uh, brought those issues because actually a number of them, I think, are crucial when it comes to... Um, energy transition, however we would like to define it. But I think that, and I would completely agree with you, that um, all the low-hanging fruits have been already picked up. So right now we are in the middle of, I, I would say, um, more difficult, more challenging times. Um, and that does not only refer to uh, the British economy, but that I think that, all, that it particularly depends to Central Eastern European economies. Uh, I think that uh, the COVID impact will be, um, is unprecedented, but will have a, a huge um, um, uh, landmark on how the energy transition pace uh, will look like in the future. So we know that uh, the British economy uh, have been severely impacted by, uh, by COVID, even more than um, repeatedly um, brought up a case of, uh, of the US. Um, so the question is how in those conditions we can find um, resources and, um, and how we can to some extent encourage companies and industry to go into more challenging uh, direction. I think that in case of UK there's another issue that has to some extent overlapped a period that we are in and this is of course the Brexit. So there is a number of companies who've been, say, who've been uh, saying that uh, once the Brexit cap happened, uh, you know, they've been on the top of uh, the uh, first lockdown. Uh, however, uh, when calculated, number of them mm, uh, significantly uh, decreased the exports uh, to the EU, and on the other hand, the imports from the EU uh, have been also, uh, uh, to some extent, stopped. And the question is, how are we going to go into the direction of this nature uh, positive economy? Uh, I would say that there are a few solutions, and to some extent, Green Deal um, is, I would say, an answer to that question. Uh, and of course, Green Deal in general is to bring uh, the economies, um, the climate neutrality. Um, so we've been talking a lot about the net zero innovation 
so to some extent that refers to uh, uh, to the idea of uh, R&D innovations that are needed for the energy transition. That brings net zero uh, mobility, uh, but also um, that encourages to withdraw from fossil fuels. So we've been uh, very often, uh, we, we've heard that uh, the time of fossil fuels have just ended. But the question is, are we just before the next era, or um, this is just happening? Uh, I've, um, during the last conference that I was attending, which was um, uh, in Jeshu, we've talked a lot about the hydrogen. So um, I think that hydrogen nowadays is a kind of fuel that will help us to um, reach those goals. Um, I believe, like, Ten years ago, the MIT study on the natural gas said that the, the natural gas is going to be a bridge fuel to the hydrogen era. So now we are actually thinking that we are just in the middle of, of the revolution and we are knocking at the door of the hydrogen era. And uh, UK is also a very good example of that, since um, uh, in Wales there is one of the biggest research facilities uh, uh, on uh, the use of hydrogen. Um, the very good example of how countries use, um, let's say, green funds or uh, green recovery funds is the OECD um, uh, database that shows um, that um, specifically countries that lead in the energy transition, and that's of, uh, of course, the case of Germany, uh, are putting a lot of money to the R&D investments. Um, if you compare that, for instance, with UK, here, again, this um, R&D green investments are substantial. But again, uh, in the same statistic, uh, Poland uses a lot of regulatory um, incentives uh, maybe not that much uh, R&D investment outlays. So uh, I would say that this is a challenge, and this is a challenge for uh, all the economies. Um, I believe that one of the mm, issues on one of the last steps that has uh, very clearly showed a path towards greening uh, the economy was also uh, UK's uh, presidency in the G7 group. Uh, the very interesting um, um, communication um, after the G7 summit uh, gave us lots of the insights on how the countries can achieve climate neutrality. But the question is whether it's going to be only declaration or whether it goes into operational pipeline, as always, I would say. But I, I believe that it builds a political momentum before Glasgow. And the question is, um, you know, what the Glasgow will bring. I understand that the crucial issue behind it, uh, and this is something what um, what UK has been uh, putting top of the agenda, is uh, going into the uh, nationally determined contribution, so NDCs. Um, so we'll see. Uh, definitely UK is quite, I would say, ahead of um, even European countries committing to 68% uh, of the decrease, while in the uh, EU we do have 55 uh, as of now. Mm, but yeah, the, the, I would say that the question remains open and uh, this question will be answered in Glasgow. Thank you very much. And um, I will now hand you over to uh, Anthony. Thank you very much, and really good to, to be with you. Um, the final comments really do um, tee me up very nicely in terms of what I'd like to say in terms of the climate negotiations. And, and the question is, what is the in, impact of the Katowice rulebook? And I think it's, we are, it's important to recognize that the UNFCCC and the international climate negotiations are part of a process. We have troughs and peaks in terms of the importance and, and the topics that different uh, of these COPs, these conferences of the parties discuss. Uh, as was mentioned, Glasgow uh, in sort of six weeks time uh, is COP26. Uh, it is a very important COP. It is when for the first time we will be looking at the NDCs as the previous speaker mentioned, these nationally determined contributions. Uh, and it's, it's important to reflect. They were first set before Paris uh, in 2015. And there has been significant changes in the climate change debate, almost unrecognizable in some sectors. What was, we are much clearer about what the science is telling us in terms of climate change. The consequences in terms of direct risks, i.e. Yeah, increasing uh, flooding or increasing temperatures, 
But also we're starting to see uh, on a much more regular basis, this is systemic risks and the cascading risks where impacts in, in one country, so, so that a, a crop failure in one country is affecting migration, which is affecting another country. So climate change's reach and its impact is significantly increasing. And I think it is very clear over the last five or six years, the consequence of that. I think the other really important change is, is, is one of optimism, is we are, we are seeing low carbon technologies and systems, and a stress and systems, being put in place that really can deliver services that are as cheap, if not cheaper, and in some ways better than the existing ones in terms of fossil fuels. Um, if we look at the price of renewables uh, since the, the agreement in Paris, I, I think at Paris people were saying, we think soon renewables will be competitive with fossil fuels. We're now seeing the International Energy Agency and others saying in many parts of the world now, it is cheaper to build more renewable, to build renewables than continue to operate your fossil fuel plants. So we have a totally different dynamic in terms of what can be achieved and over what time scale. So things have changed since Paris, but Glasgow is absolutely fundamental. Um, there's a few things that's just worth mentioning in terms of what are the challenges that we face uh, within a couple of months. Firstly, obviously, the mitigation targets, the NDCs. Rightly, the UK has been uh, highlighted as having a, a very ambitious NDC. Um, it is probably one of the most ambitious in the world. Important to stress, though, it's not about just setting targets, about how you implement them. And there was a, a, a very uh, good quote, I think, from Lord uh, Deben, who is the, the head of the, the, the Committee on Climate Change, that gave the UK eight out of 10 for setting targets and maybe four or five out of 10 for meeting them. So setting targets is one thing, but we need to meet them. And that's many of the things that uh, Juliet mentioned in terms of the, the building blocks of, of good policy. So the NDCs, UK is doing very well, E is doing well, US, the introduction, uh, the President Biden has rejoined the Paris Agreement and has set an NDC that is, yeah, 50 to 52 percent below 2005 levels is, is a real step forward. But not all G20 countries have done that. And I think that's what we will be looking to in the coming weeks. Uh, and maybe even next week at the UN General Assembly, will some of the, 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 the key countries be bringing forward new climate, climate pledges? I do hope so. But it is what is clear at the moment is that we are still some way off what is required in terms of the Paris Agreement, in terms of the overall temperature objective. So we do need countries to step up in terms of Paris uh, and the NDCs. Just before moving on from mitigation, it's important to mention that it's not just about the targets. Uh, and there is many good opportunities in the, co the coming months to, to really shift uh, the options for mitigation. And there are sector initiatives uh, phasing out coal, electric vehicles uh, speeding up, lots on energy efficiency. All of these things can be dealt with, with through cooperation and collaboration on the international stage. So well, that's another thing to look out for. I think the second important area for us to, to assess is the question of international climate finance. And the, the developed countries have pledged that there would be $100 billion a year made available to developing countries for adaptation and mitigation. And this, this pledge was made uh, uh, in and around Paris, and it hasn't yet been met. So I, I think many people will be looking and looking and seeing, will the developed countries step up and make more funding available for other countries? And I think this is a, a really important issue for large numbers of countries and civil society around the world. So again, I think something to look at. And two other areas. One will be, as was mentioned, the, the Katowice rulebook was was a key deliverable uh, for, from that COP24. It's in the, the whole Paris rule, but hasn't quite been finished yet. And so people will be looking for, for Glasgow to, to hopefully sign off a number of other issues, in particular in terms of carbon markets, uh, things around transparency, and really clarifying how the ratchet, ratchet mechanism will work to, to ensure that we continue to see improvements within uh, the mitigation targets. And finally, the challenge for COP26, as we are facing today, as we're in different parts of the world uh, discussing these key issues, is the extent to which uh, the COVID situation stops uh, and restricts access and stops some of the dialogues. Because COP26 isn't just about 
the sort of the signing of agreements. It's about building ambition. It's about building confidence. It's enabling cooperation in the future. And so it, having an inclusive COP, either through people being present or through virtual uh, workshops and discussions, will be absolutely crucial. And I think that is a, a, a really difficult issue for the, the UK government to face. So thank you very much indeed. and look forward to the discussion. Thank you to the three of, uh, of, of panelists. And uh, what I suggest, um, I will start with uh, quick free warm-up questions to the panelists uh, so that we check how it works, uh, how we are able to interact in this hybrid uh, connection. Uh, so maybe let me start with a question to Anthony. Um, in your opinion, um, last one year and a half, the COVID time, was a debt Paradoxically, paradoxically, a good or bad time for the fight against climate change? Uh, I'm not sure this is a quick, a quick question, really. <laughs> um, but uh, ups and downs. I mean, I think w what we have seen uh, was a, a rapid reduction of emissions uh, last year. So industrial activity slowed down and stopped. People traveled less. People's, um, people bought less in some cases. So that there was a, a rapid reduction of emissions, which is positive, but it's then bounced back up again because the, the economies uh, and people's behavior ha, has, has gone back to, to, in some degrees, to what it were, was beforehand. But, so good and bad there, I, I think what has happened to some degree is money that was made available for economic recovery in some places has been earmarked for green projects. But I would say n not to the degree that was necessary. So only a, a relatively small percentage, uh, somewhat or 10 or 15 percent, I think, on the na on the international level, was earmarked for green developments. And I think that was a really wasted opportunity. What we don't want to be doing is is supporting businesses that within five or 10 years will have to be wound down because they aren't compatible with uh, a a stable climate. So I think that was a wasted opportunity. I, I do think that the, probably the, the most optimistic thing is, is that people are starting to see that things don't have to be as they always were. And I think that's an important mindset for addressing climate change. At the beginning, you, you mentioned in an ideal world, we'd all be in the same room. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe this is the ideal world, is that we can communicate, we can hold virtual conferences in which the debates are as lively, we can get as much out of it, and we haven't had to fly to Poland. So I, I think some things have changed for the good, and I, I, I do notice that within Chatham House. As a foreign affairs think tank, we will shift away from insisting that everything be in person. So I, I think some, some things have been, have been changed forever, which I, I think will be positive. Thank you, especially for the last comment, because I was expecting some of you to tell me that maybe the perfect world is not the one that we had before. Uh, now I have a warm-up warm question to Honorata. Um, we have six weeks left to the COP. Um, what we can do, what we can change, what can change in general, so that this moment in Glasgow becomes a success? Well, that's a tough question. I think that six weeks is, uh, you know, this is too short to have, this is a too short uh, period of time to have like huge declarations. And I bet that uh, the negotiating teams uh, have already uh, made clear their positions. And, uh, you know, they do have the agenda that they want to play with uh, during COP26. Uh, but I believe that COP26 is, uh, like Anthony mentioned, something more, I mean, beyond just uh, the, let's say, negotiating event. Uh, this is a moment in time, and I think each year that was something what we've been uh, uh, looking for, when the countries are also um, showing their commitments, but, all, but in a way uh, of, I would say, political commitments to climate neutrality. 
And this is, I would say, something more, and that goes uh, beyond numbers that, that they would be negotiating, uh, beyond different side events that uh, the negotiating teams are participating in. So, uh, in my opinion, COP26 is, is something more than that. And I said before, with six weeks, you can do nothing, but I bet that negotiators have already uh, made clear what they want to actually uh, achieve. And um, no wonder that those positions are, I would say, say, mm, strictly attached to um, economies situations and uh, economies resource endowment. Uh, I think that um, um, very often uh, the depicted the situation of the UK is far different from what we have in Poland, right? So if you have the electricity generation, which is in majority based on um, either natural gas, which is set to be let's say, the most friendly uh, fossil fuel uh, of all, and uh, then um, the nuclear. And if you compare it with Poland, which is highly dependent on coal, then there's no difference that, that those uh, positions will be Mm, I would say diverging to some extent, right? But I believe that there's a space to uh, find a common ground and there's a space to actually build a political momentum also around COP26. Uh, but if I may, just to quickly um, uh, uh, go to what Anthony said, uh, I also believe that COVID will be to some extent a catalyst for positive uh, changes. Uh, mm, but I think that during COVID, we've seen that very... Um, precisely, that the uh, consumer patterns of using energy have changed. Of course, you may say that resulted in decreased industrial use of energy, but on the other hand, there was a huge number of um, um, uh, individual consumers uh, who've uh, definitely uh, increased their um, electricity uh, use. But at the same time, I would say there is a huge hope uh, in the youth, because uh, according to the latest opinion polls, uh, throughout the world, uh, this is the generation, also the Generation Z, who seeks uh, um, the answers to climate issues and is very vocal about it. I would say that 20 years ago, nobody would be that vocal about climate issues as, as the Generation Z is now. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, last question on my side for the moment, of course. Uh, to Juliet, uh, we had the past, we have the present time uh, discussed, and uh, for you will be the future. What for you would be the perfect 2022 year like, uh, right after COP? <laughs> right after COP. Um, so I think if I look at, just, just coming back to the, the builds that we're seeing at the moment, um, one of the things I think we've, we're going to have the political situation put forward, um, as Honorat has talked about, in terms of what the situation in each country is. So, so they will be taking their current situation and that will be their negotiation position. I think the thing that will change at COP this year is I do think we will see much more public engagement than we've ever seen before. I think the, the situations in New York with the flooding, in Germany with flooding, with the, with the fires sort of worldwide, and generations that are coming through, that pressure is going to become increasingly um, more important on politicians. And, and the media is going to follow that. So I think, I think this is what's going to be interesting for me uh, about COP26 is, is what the media do with this. And then in, in terms of kind of looking forward to what, what happens straight afterwards, um, I mean, I think, I think we, in the UK at least, I'm already beginning to see the pieces fall together. So for the first time, uh, we've got a real call on R&D, research and development and innovation. Um, actually, over the last 10 years, uh, there's been very little spent in zero carbon. Most of the funding in the UK has gone towards medical, uh, automotive or, or, or aerospace. So energy has really been the poor cousin in innovation. And I think we're beginning to see that shift already. We're beginning to see a net zero uh, innovation strategy really come through very strongly. And, and for, for countries like the UK, that's, that's somewhere we have a uh, world leading uh, research facility here. We should be investing much more in this future. So I think uh, the, really the declaration around countries, what are they going to be doing around innovation and research? Um, and then I think the the next piece is, and 
uh, for me in a perfect world, we then start to talk about what are we going to do about engaging with consumers? Because uh, the as I said, UK is now one of the most important uh, power sources in the UK is renewables. It's like 40, 45 um, percent. But the next part, which you've already touched on, will be more difficult. And that will be about reducing uh, total energy usage, uh, energy efficiency, all the all the more tricky pieces, because it's not big technology fixes. It's actually integrating that into society. And I think that is something that we need to start to, uh, if, if I was looking to straight after COP, what would I want to see? Well, uh, there's actually, if I take it slightly away from the typical areas, uh, there was a report that went out yesterday from BAFTA, which is the British um, Film TV Foundation, talking about um, how much, so, so the British TV uh, and film industry is a really very important industry for the UK economy. And um, I, I think the concept that we talk about cake more on TV than we talk about climate change uh, is, 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 it, it t takes us back to what is our societal and cultural shifts that we need to see. And I think that concept of actually how do we weave <clears throat> the story around climate change its solutions, its um, urgency into our everyday uh, sort of drama that we watch. We, I mean, the average person in the UK, I think, watches one or two hours of TV. One of the most influential pieces of input to people's lives is, is what you watch on screen. And if, that, if climate change is completely absent from that and the solutions to climate change, then moving a society forward. So what I will, would really like to see post-COP is going to be see that actually that it's, it's uh, climate change and its solutions are embraced by the whole of society, not just the policymakers um, and, and not just the, the, the energy companies. Thank you. Um, I also had a look yesterday on that uh, report uh, from BAFTA, and it was really surprising. And I was immediately thinking, what would be the, the, the statistics, the data for Poland? Uh, in the UK, it was the research showed that banana bread was more frequently heard than term uh, wind power and solar power combined uh, in 2020. For me, that was surprising. I am wondering what would be the Polish version of the banana bread. Uh, um, maybe pierogi. Um, it seems to me that after this short, uh, let's say, intro introduction, um, to quote uh, Juliet, uh, easy stuff is done. And uh, the difficult stuff is ahead of us. Um, to bring a short summary, it seems that we have growing risks with uh, all the weather problems, weather-related problems, floodings, fires, etc., etc., uh, that we can see as um, things that happen today, tomorrow, or a couple of days ago, but in fact they are strictly related to climate change. We've got growing challenges, uh, we've got less and less time, still a lot of things to do. Uh, we need bigger involvement of uh, climate finance, of YAF, of business, of uh, consumers. Uh, we have to increase our ambitions. Uh, we have to set and also um, not only set, but meet targets that was underlined by uh, Anthony. Um, we have to invest more, we have to show commitment, we have to engage, engage, and once again, engage uh, with uh, the others, with civil society as well. Um, still a lot of things uh, remain to be done, and this is a moment when I would like to ask uh, the audience to ask questions, and we have a microphone in here, and I am wondering what are your questions, what are your, your doubts, uh, and what questions you have to our panelists. And maybe I will begin with the first person who raised uh, his hand. So please, sir, there's the microphone. We, we can't hear you. Just a second, we'll find another microphone. So, oh, that's better. Um, Stephen Webster, Imperial College. My first question comes from you really about the media and 
the media coming to Glasgow. What's the role, do you think, of the Polish media in terms of what's coming? Will the Polish media be covering COP26? How will they cover it? And my second question perhaps is for Anthony, and it's about Chatham House as a community builder. Um, you, didn't, you, said, you talked a little about developing countries, but as a policy maker, kind of how are you seeing the role of lower and middle income countries and the way they um, um, influence COP26? Because of course, that's, you know, they're, they're such a crucial part of the parties. And we know from Fiji and from Bonn, those, those um, COPs, you know, there were quite a few parties who were indigenous groups and um, from low-lying areas. So how are you seeing it now in terms of COP26, in terms of the involvement of um, lower and middle in income countries? But really my first question is, the media are going to be important. Um, how will this play out in Poland? Thank you. I think that I will maybe collect two more questions and then we will have a round of answers. So uh, maybe, sir, please, uh, can we have a microphone here in the front? Thanks very much. Uh, Robin Niblett with Chatham House. Great set of presentations. Thank you very much. Um, I haven't seen the BAFTA report. Uh, a very interesting point. I suppose the question would be what words would you look for? I'd love to know how much reference there was to planet because as far as I can see, everyone watches David Attenborough's Blue Planet, Healthy Planet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it may be just not walking through the door of climate change, but walking through a different door is the way of engaging people uh, in terms of words. Um, specifically, I wanted to, Juliet, you said that maybe the trickiest thing um, is reducing energy usage and then this shift to the role of individuals, heating, etc. cetera. Um, I want to ask all of you, I suppose, about the price of energy. I mean, the big feature at the moment in Europe at the moment, and I was in Spain over part of this summer, you could not get away on the radio from discussions about the price uh, for consumers of energy and the huge spike it's taken uh, in really since January this year. And some of the numbers are quite remarkable, both the uh, per ton uh, price uh, on the energy trading scheme in Europe, um, uh, in Germany, uh, wholesale prices seem to have gone up massively. So how concerned are you and what does it tell us that at this time, Anthony, that you're reminding us that at some level the price of renewables is so much cheaper but the experience of consumers is it's so much more expensive. Um, so what's going on? <laughs> and it's a really bad time, I think, politically, for this price, the price spike to be taking place. Uh, so to all of our panelists, those who are studying European markets in particular, what's going on? Um, and is this going to become a, a real problem? Okay, thank you. And the third question, uh, there will be another round. Uh, I will uh, ask maybe, uh, yes, please. Uh, there will be one. Uh, hello, this is Przemysław Biskup from PISM. Uh, I wanted to ask one question concerning uh, the future of the nuclear energy, especially in the light of uh, announcement that was made, uh, I think, yesterday uh, evening concerning uh, the British, Australian, uh, American program of building up nuclear submarines. I mean, nuclear powered. But uh, my point is that uh, you can't really have such a program without um, parallel civilian uh, nuclear energy program because uh, otherwise it's not feasible uh, economically. So what's, what's the future for, for the nuclear energy, especially taken that uh, nuclear energy is not just about energy, it's also very much about hard security and geopolitics? Thank you very much. Um, maybe I will... Um call upon Honorata first, because uh, it seems to me that the question on media might be uh, very relevant to your experience and your work. Uh, you have to know that uh, Honorata um, is also working on some, let's say, semantic dimensions of uh, energy aspects, energy security, and it was also one of my questions for the future <laughs> debate uh, on uh, how you can answer to the media problem and to the semantic problem of climate change. Thank you for this. Uh, well, uh, I think that the question was more about the media coverage of the COP, if I, if I got that correctly, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, well, you know, that depends uh, on the, I would say, media, uh, and then depends um, on what the 
precise person wishes to uh, look at, right? So um, I would say that definitely uh, there's going to be a standpoint of the Polish team presented uh, uh, in, uh, in some media. Uh, and in the others, there's going to be maybe more of the global view. But um, you don't know it. And um, I'm honestly not the person to compare that. And I don't feel um, you know, uh, comfortable with, uh, with even doing that. Um, so, uh, so that would be my answer to the media uh, coverage question. Uh, if I may take uh, the, the question on sure, the go ahead. Uh, at the same time. Uh, and here I will go a little bit more with the semantics. Uh, so, you know, the, 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 the price issue is one of those dimensions in, in energy economics, which is, I would say, crucial behind the affordability concept. And um, that means that for some people, the price of energy would be too high. For the others, let's say that would be moderate. But at the end of the day, it's a question if they can afford it easily, because that's what's at the heart of the energy security. So we say that there is no energy security if, firstly, there is no physical supply of energy, and secondly, if it's not available to people, I mean affordable to people, because what use do you have of the energy that you have at place, but you cannot afford it, right? And this is something what I think Christopher Frey was, uh, uh, was trying to say when he built his um, energy policy uh, hierarchy of needs. So he said, firstly, the supply, then the affordability, and then on the top of that, the climate awareness. And I completely agree with this, because how can you talk to people uh, in, um, uh, in developing countries about the access to modern energy if, if they don't have the access to energy at all, right? So firstly, you need to have the access, then the affordability dimension, and, and then goes everything else. And I think that that is why Germany is so much ahead of other countries. Because firstly, well, they, they do have this bottom pyramid line, uh, met and they can go. Uh, they can go further on. So uh, that would be this uh, this this price dimension question and the future of nuclear energy. I mean, uh, I'm very happy that you raised it because honestly, this. I mean, Poland is right now in the middle of trying to you know build commence the first nuclear uh, power plant, and we know that this period has been postponed a number of times. I remember uh, when the first nuclear power plant was to be ready in 2021. Uh, the first reactor. Uh, but I would say that advantage is that this is one of those, let's say, low emissive fuels. Um, and in number of actually declarations and documents, uh, countries are sticking to nuclear to show that this is one of the options to go through energy transition. Because if you do have fossils, if you do have um, the intermittency problem with renewables, you have to have something what gives you the base load and you if you, if you uh, give up on coal, if you give up on other fossil fuels, how can you build that? So I would say that this is a, you know, a kind of um, decision what will work for you and what will work for you in, in, in the transition period. Thank you. I saw uh, Juliet shaking her head and willing to add something and <laughs> <laughs> intervene. Go ahead. Um, so, I mean, if I... If I can come to the point about wholesale markets and, and the energy cost at the moment that we've seen. So just, just to take back a little bit in terms of what is going on right now in the, in the European markets and what that means from a consumer point of view. So um, during COVID last year, sort of um, in 2020, power markets dropped significantly. So uh, wholesale markets in the UK went from about sort of typical price, 50, 60 pounds per megawatt hour to around sort of 20. So in fact, a lot of supply companies lost money because they bought forward in the marketplace. Then demand dropped by up to sort of 30% in the business sector. So you, were, you bought power and then you didn't have anywhere to sell it to and the markets had dropped. What we're seeing now is a sort of recovery and then over recovery of the really driven by gas price uh, in the European markets at the moment. And particularly we're seeing some, I can't remember which pipeline is out. There's one of the northern pipelines is not delivering. So this time of year is particularly bad as well. It's a, it's a, what's called a shoulder month. So most of, a lot of any power, power stations go, uh, get, go into refurbishment during the summer months because you can obviously see that they're getting ready for the winter. The timing in terms of when that comes on, plus we've got, uh, there's a, I think there is a hurricane sitting 
in uh, sort of in America, which is then becoming a lot of Northern Europe. So you're missing a lot of the uh, wind power. So we've got we've got a kind of whole set of situations coming out of COVID, <clears throat> sort of a particular weather situation. Plus, you've got gas markets going through the roof. So that is what's happening in terms of passing that through. In terms of what that means from a consumer point of view, initially during the year, they would have been quite insulated because power companies would have forward hedged. But what, what I think is quite interesting in the new debate is, what does this mean? What, what actions do consumers have at their fingertips to be able to take action? And previously, you could have just switched supplier or just got, um, and, and prior to that, you didn't have any choice. You, you might switch the lights off. That would have been sort of your action as a consumer action. What I think is going to be interesting going forward is part of the actions that consumers will be able to take will be to put a solar panel on their roof. And by putting a solar panel on your roof, you will significantly reduce your power costs. And we're, we're already seeing that coming through in rooftop solar, particularly in the business sector, where business customers are saying, actually, I want to insulate myself from this changing power market. I'm just going to put a solar, I'm going to put solar panels on my roof. I don't have to pay for them because the finance market will come and finance it. And I will sign a 20 year deal where I get fixed power prices. And I think this is this, these are some of the options we're going to come start to see come through in terms of what how consumers can engage with this market. They don't just need to engage and be a passive consumer to a utility. They can actually become an active consumer, prosumers, as we've called it in the UK. Um, and, and then just to ch touch on the nuclear program, and nuclear energy is one of the most expensive ways to decarbonize. So if you look at the power cost of building Hinkley Point in the UK, uh, I think it's 120 pounds per megawatt hour is that cost. Um, and what the average cost recently for, for wind power is like 40 or 43. So there is a significant distance. You need to be a rich country if you want to put nuclear in essentially. Um, and I think that comes to the point that was being made is that can you have a, a domestic nuclear program if you uh, if you don't have um, a sort of a security program alongside it? And I think that becomes hugely geopolitical. And for me, nuclear has always been about geopolitics. It's very not really been about energy. And so I think I think we need to. Uh, look at nuclear in the context of where is it already, what is its existing potential. But I mean, I think uh, this, the most recent site in the UK was at 21 years um, since it got the political thumbs up. So, so my question would be, is can nuclear deliver within the timescales that we need on climate change? Um, and since you can build a solar park within three months, my view would be you can reduce cost and move much faster if you look at a renewable base. Now, now the baseline piece is something we need to fix, but but to be honest, there are methodologies that we can look at that. So that, that would be my view on it. Okay, thank you. Uh, just to satisfy my personal curiosity, uh, what is your view on small modular reactors and uh, their role? It's not that much so of geopolitics. So, so small modular reactors are really interesting, and I think the the, the work that's going on in terms of the R and D, there's significant R and D I know in the UK because I've seen some of it. I think one of the big questions is going to be where can you put them because most of them are going to you're going to need to operate them like a combined heat and power um, plant. So you're going to need the heat output to be able to make them to work effectively. And the question is where so, so therefore do you put them near large urban situations? So do you have a nuclear power station within the middle of a city? Does that work? Or do you actually have sufficient heat need? Um, because one of the things we quite often think about, we think about the technology, but not actually where you use the output of that technology. And I think this, for me, is going to be the big question for small nuclear reactors, is where do you use the heat? OK, thank you. Uh, just before I give the floor to Anthony, who is waiting patiently for his turn, uh, there is Honorata willing to just add some point uh, to this. Yes, Susanna, you ask us to be provocative a little bit, so I'll take the liberty of, of that ac actually request. Uh, so uh, I do have the question to Anthony and, and Juliet at the same time. Uh, Juliet, you mentioned that nuclear is about geopolitics, but I think that in general, energy at all, 
in, in each, I would say, resource or, or the type of fuel is about geopolitics. We do see that in the natural gas. We do see that in, uh, in nuclear. I think that we do see that also in renewables. Uh, uh, so, I mean, is it not all about geopolitics? In, in crude oil as well, right? Trying to be a little bit provocative, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's perfect. That's exactly the point. My, my view is actually I think solar is probably the least geopolitical technology that you can have, partially because you can deploy it as an individual on your house. So if I wanted to build a nuclear power station in my backyard at home, uh, that I would find that very difficult. So the accessibility to the technology, I think, is as as important. So if you have a pipeline, you can you can control the end of it. So you dictate as the owner of that pipeline where that power goes or where the oil or gas goes, um, and therefore you can dictate whether you switch it on and off. And that's when it becomes geopolitical. You're completely right. And, and very similarly with nuclear, the, because you have to have a whole infrastructure in terms of dealing with the waste, particularly and dealing with the fuel and the health and safety issues related to it. For me, um, wind power probably slightly more so, but but solar particularly is 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 not geopolitical. It's probably one of the fewest few technologies that isn't in that um, I can deploy it anywhere pretty much, and I can uh, I, anybody can own it, and that's where I think you break down that. that I mean, that's why I've always loved renewables to a certain extent because it, although it, it it is resource based and and you need you need the resource. Um, sort of anybody can get access to it. Um, Anthony, on the top of all the questions that you already um, have to address, I will add just one more. Um, to what extent climate is about geopolitics? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It is. Maybe I could start with the, not a contrary to what Juliet is saying, but one of the, my colleagues at Chatham House always used to say that one of the biggest geopolitical weapons that the UK could do would be to insulate roofs across the UK. <laughs> because if we stopped yeah. burning Russian gas and importing Russian gas from other places or gas from other places, that would have a huge geopolitical impact. And I think it's true. If Europe as a whole stopped importing fossil fuels from let's say Russia or the Middle East, that changes geopolitics. So insulation is, is geopolitical, I'd say. So maybe that's a, a bit contrary to what <laughs> you were saying about uh, solar. Maybe just to finish that theme in terms of geopolitics and energy, I, I think nuclear is different because it is a, I, I would agree, lots of energy is geopolitical. I think nuclear is different because it has a military connection. Uh, and it is, I, I don't think I'd go as far as say that Clearly, not everyone who build, builds civil nuclear power has a desire to build military or ha have a military application for that. But it's very clear that if you want to have a military application for nuclear, it helps having civilian. And it's not just in waste management. Turbine manufacturing is, a, is an obvious example. Rolls-Royce makes turbines for nuclear propulsion, and it does for uh, civilian nuclear power stations. So there is a crossover. Uh, and it helps with the economics, and I think that's widely recognized. But I don't think that the, as I said, if you want civil nuclear, it doesn't mean that you necessarily want to have a, a nuclear weapons program. Just one final point on, on the sort of the geopolitics, because as was mentioned in the question, the announcement overnight of the strategic relationship, uh, security relationship between Australia, UK, and the US, it involves potential sale of nuclear submarines. And I think this is a, a significant move. I, it has, we, have, we have yet to see what the, the full reaction from China is. And as I understand it, China wasn't mentioned in, in the announcement. But it is a, a, a clear question of, of in, or a, a opportunity or is seen as a reaction to development in the region, including China. And what we're looking to in terms of COP is Chinese engagement. And we are China at last year's UNGA, UN General Assembly, it was there that was announced that they would go for a 2060 carbon neutrality target. And I think there was hope that in the meetings next week, there would be similar announcements or announcements on China making more ambition in terms of climate change. So. It, it, we cannot separate these two issues, 
And when John Kerry went to visit China two weeks ago, this was the, the, the public announcement from China in response is, we do not separate our, our climate change activities from wider geopolitical issues. So it, climate change is part of the discussions and is part of geopolitics. So it is something that we do need to look out for and be aware of. Um, in terms of the other question, I, I think the other one that was mainly focused to me was, was the vulnerable, uh, the question of developing countries and vulnerable countries at COP. And absolutely, this is a, I think there is, in terms of my introduction, that I mentioned that the 100 billion, so this 100 billion dollars a year from should be achieved by 2020. Uh, we haven't achieved that. So I, I think many countries are looking for the developed world to be stepping up and making more finance available. And it, it's not just, it, this is 100 billion of public, public sector money, uh, and it will be then matched by private sector. It really is important that, al although this isn't all that's needed, it is a, a, a symbol of the willingness of the developed countries to help the rest of the world. And I think it's quite similar to the vaccine debate, really, as, as unless we can, roll out vaccines around the world and not just in the developed countries, not in the West, then we don't address this question. We will have new variants coming up. And, and so in the same way with climate change, we can't just address it in a, in a small number of countries. It has to be a, a global effort. And I think that's what the 100 billion is symbolic of, even though it is not the only solution. And so I, I, I do think that we will see, unless uh, more financing available, unless there is more assistance, unless there's more cooperation to help on adaptation. And it's not just mitigation, it's adaptation. We are seeing the impacts of climate change already. And it is those countries that are wealthier that can put in place adaptation measures are far less affected by climate change. Um, we just see this in, in small periods of times in, in terms of in the United States, New Orleans, 15 years ago, there was a, a climate event that led to thousands of people dying because they didn't have in place the necessary infrastructure. Just this year, we had a similar climate event and a handful of people died, however tragic, but they had been able to put in place measures to withstand more extreme weather events. And that's not the same for other parts of the world. So absolutely adaptation and finance for adaptation will be crucial to getting a, a, a good deal out of, out of Glasgow. Thank you. I think that financing will be one of the most important elements of, of the COP26, and this will be the, the core of the, of the debate. Um, I know there are some other questions here in the room. Yes, sir, please. Hello, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, I'm uh, Valdemar Januszczak. I'm the art critic of the Sunday Times in London. Um, so, uh, excuse me, I'm something of a trespasser uh, on this terrain. Um, I, I wanted just to uh, relate something to you which seems incredibly pertinent to me, and that was um, there was a craze uh, last year for these things in art called NFTs, not non-fungible tokens. I don't know if we've heard of them or not, but it was basically a way of selling digital art, um, in, uh, uh, marketing digital art in a way that made it sellable, so that you sold something which everybody had access to on their computer, but you're the only person that owned it because there was this sale process involved. Now, what interested me about it was there was a case of um, a French artist who sold one of his artworks uh, on one of these uh, digital auctions for several uh, hundred thousand pounds or euros at the time. But he then went home and worked out that, um, and he's an artist who was very concerned with climate issues, with ecological issues. He went home and worked out that the selling of that artwork, um, the carbon footprint left by that, what's called a drop, the NFT drop, was the equivalent of three years of uh, energy use in his studio. So that one moment of selling on the, on the internet had actually left a carbon footprint that was the equivalent of three years of renting his studio. And I, I, so I, I mention this only because um, I'm interested in the whole idea of, of of, of the carbon footprint of the internet, um, the World Wide Web. Anthony, you, you said that, that you, were saving, uh, you were saving a certain amount of energy use by not flying to Poland and by staying in, in London and appearing to, in front of us now. But I mean, how much work has actually gone into proving that? I mean, uh, by, by that I mean, is, is the 
use of um, energy involved in, in the internet, in this endless Zooming that we all did over the COVID years, um, is that actually uh, something that uses up or, or creates a carbon footprint that is actually far more dramatic than we know? And I ask that as a question because uh, I'm totally ignorant on, on these matters, but you must presumably have done quite a lot of research into that. And just on the principle there's no such thing as a free lunch, is this new digital world in which we are talking to each other uh, across the internet rather than face to face? I mean, is that in itself uh, a carbon problem? That's my question. Thank you very much for this uh, small provocation. Uh, <laughs> um, I have a question from the live chat also. Um, in fact, there's a number of questions, but I will right now quote just, just one coming from. Uh, the UK, um, the UK, the UK coal producing regions have still not recovered from the social and economic results of the unjust transition from coal in the 1980s. Our lessons learned a topic of current Anglo-Polish discussion. So I think this might be a question to, the, to, to, to all of the panelists. And uh, one more question here uh, in the room, please. Hi, thanks. Uh, I'm Rupa Huck. I'm a member of parliament for a seat in suburban London. And I wanted to ask really how you can get uh, individual people in suburban London to make those sacrifices at an individual level that may be necessary. So, uh, you know, recycling is something I think everyone does without thinking about now. But then if, you know, when the gas spoiler goes, how do you persuade people to go electric or what are they meant to do? I've moved over to an induction hob, which is a complicated electric cooker this year. I used to like my gas cooker. That's my small thing. But in terms of um, national government policy, the active travel agenda to sort of make people leave behind the car and do more walking and cycling has been controversial in suburban London. Uh, I think it's easier to sell in Copenhagen. How do you get people to do this? What inducements can you offer them? Um, yeah, and, you know, because often they say back, well, you know, it's China, Russia, whoever, people with oil rigs, they need to sort it out. Me uh, taking the car is not going to solve it. So, yeah, how should we be selling this? Thank you very much. Um, the good thing is that all of the panelists are willing to react, and they will do so. The bad thing is that we have only 10 minutes left, so I will have to ask you to be uh, quite concise. But I think in 10 minutes, we are still able to get very meaningful answers. So maybe let's start this time with um, Juliet. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you, great questions. Um, uh, actually, I'm gonna slightly plug, I do a podcast called Great Green Questions. And we did answer this question about, I had Mike Berners-Lee who has written a book called How Bad Are Bananas? which I would recommend to anybody who wants to look up the carbon footprint of anything, pretty much. Uh, so Mike's gone through what is the carbon footprint of banana, but also uh, we, I had him on, on the podcast really to talk around what is the carbon footprint of uh, sort of Zoom, what is the carbon footprint of uh, streaming, Netflix, what is the carbon footprint of all these things that we've taken up uh, really with gusto during COVID. And, and, the, and the answer is, um, first of all, you should try and watch a screen with a friend uh, is, is, the, is the key thing. So actually, because there's more than one person in the room that we're screening to, this is worthwhile. If you're just screening to one person, it starts to become less worthwhile. Um, and then in terms of uh, the, the really bad thing, um, actually, in terms of electronic thing is uh, Bitcoin. So uh, coin mining is probably one of the highest uses of energy that you can have from a digital world. And it's one of the biggest challenges is where we should probably put them all up in Iceland because one, they need cooling and two, they need an abundant amount of renewable power to, to really justify them. So most of the electronics is, is, is this kind of... Um, so, um, uh, streaming is much better than traveling. So yeah, take a look. His book is brilliant as well. Uh, and so I, I would really recommend to look at that. And, um, your turn. and then is, is it worth me talking Sorry. about the gas boiler? Sorry. Go ahead, Juliet. Yeah, so, so in terms of switching over to gas boilers, I mean, there, there are two things in here. One is going to be design about 
the, the technology that we move to right now, air source heat pumps, which is one of the key technologies for, um, I was talking to somebody about this last night, they are noisy. They are not very, they're pretty ugly. Um, and actually, and they're not very appropriate for sort of central London, particularly, or any central cities. So we're going to have to see some innovation in that technology as well. It's quite an old technology now. It's basically an air conditioning technology. So again, I would look to the design and uh, research phase that we need to see better technologies for better consumer uptake. Um, but also in terms of gas, all our subsidies on renewables are put on the electricity bill in the UK. And so gas, basically, the gas bill gets away scot-free. So there's no sort of form of carbon tax on our retail bill, whereas there is a carbon tax on our electricity bill in the UK. And, and, and one of the biggest things we could do with actually shifting uh, that tax burden to the higher carbon fuel going forwards. Thank you. Um, Anthony, your turn. Thank you. Um, maybe I'd pick up on the, the just transition question because it's absolutely fundamental. Is uh, and it's this is something that gets the heart of the energy transition in general. It will be the, the issue that sto slows down the transition. The example in yeah in the 1980s there was no just transition. The the coal mines and were closed. But it was partly for political reasons. I mean, it, it, or it had a political edge to it. It wasn't just about economics. And I think we need to recognize that areas of the country that are highly dependent on fossil fuel, be it coal, be it oil, be it gas, will need support. And it, we're fortunate in, in Western Europe that we can afford that. Uh, and yet it isn't happening to the degree that is necessary. And I think if we want to have a rapid transition, then having a just transition is absolutely fundamental. It comes back to the point that I mentioned earlier on in terms of the, the wasted opportunity that the COVID recovery funds is we need to be developing more skills in certain areas. I mean, insulation is a classic example. It is relatively low skilled, but it is or in, in terms of the fitting of it, but there is lots of skills in terms of the manufacturing of the equipment. And it tends to be a real generator of local jobs. So it is creating an economy within localities uh, and therefore it is very good from a political perspective. One of the issues around coal mining is, and, and we see this in Germany, is that the, the, you have areas that are highly dependent on coal and therefore they capture that political uh, the, the politicians within that area, and they are unable to move this forward. We need to be able to create alternatives, local jobs in the area that are, so that people can see a future without their fossil fuels. And as I said, I, I can see that how we can deal with that within Western Europe, within Europe as a whole, but we also then have to think about that in terms of larger countries. I mean, for example, in China, we have 10 million people that are working in the coal sector. And it's not just the coal sector itself. You have, it's something like a third of, of by volume, or sorry, by weight of goods that are shipped on, on the railway in China is coal. So you have on the knock-on implications of if you start phasing out coal, you're affecting the miners and you're affecting the railways. So we need to be dealing with these issues. Otherwise, we won't get the transition fast enough. And then finally, the question in terms of what can Londoners do? One is I think there is a, a bit about the change in the narrative. I don't think it's sacrifice that people, we shouldn't be asking people to sacrifice things. We should ask people to change and it's for their own good. And I mean, I, I do see that in London, as you said, the, the whole question about traffic controlling measures uh, is on my street. Uh, my street is no longer a cut through in terms of cars. So it's it slowed it all down. But it's now very annoying if I want to drive anywhere because I have to do a huge loop round somewhere else. And it will force people to uh, shift the way in which they function and, and which they go around their city. And it is painful, hopefully for a short period of time, uh, as you get used to a, a new way in which you move around the city. But I, I do think it's it's partly, it's the buy-in, it's the consumers, it's giving people alternatives so that it's not them having to sacrifice, it's people have to change, but ultimately they see the benefits of that. 
Honorat, about just transition or uh, other topics? Yeah, just transition, I'd like to also uh, pick up on this. Uh, so uh, I would completely agree with Anthony that uh, it's not only about the miners when it comes uh, to uh, the transition, but it also is about, I would say, all the supply chain that goes to the mine. So it's been, I think, estimated at some point that uh, if the mines would be closed down, some regions in uh, in Silesia region in Poland, and I think it was the city of uh, Rybnik, uh, the unemployment rate would go up to 50%, because it's not only the mine itself, but this is also the industries that are supplying uh, uh, the miners, right? So this is a huge social problem. So th that is why I, I think that uh, if that is tackled in a socially responsible way, that's a chance for success. Um, I'd like to also uh, um, go back to the issue of how to, let's say, encourage people uh, about the Londoners. Uh, well, I would say that there are three solutions. You can either force them, which always socially strikes back to the policymakers. Uh, you can encourage them, uh, which is challenging to be done because it always requires some incentives. Uh, or you can educate them. And I think that it's not that I'm in education business, right? But I think that education uh, gives uh, the best chance and the best opportunity uh, for a change. But of course, this is a long-term process. So you have to probably start with the youngest ones and probably you'll see the results in, in 10, I would say 20 years. So um, again, I believe that education is a is a key to success um, uh, in that uh, in that respect. In the previous round, there was a question about I think um, how to make developing countries, uh, uh, let's say, do some commitments in, in respect uh, uh, of the climate change. Uh, I completely agree with Anthony. Adaptation, adaptation, and adaptation. Mitigation is of course important, but uh, adaptation to climate changes, uh, especially uh, within the UNFCCC process, is a key to success. Uh, I see that there's been more of the, I would say, um, not maybe not pressure, but a um, kind of good vibes around commitments of the developing uh, nations. But uh, I must say that whether they would commit or not, this is a question which we've been observing in the UNFCCC process for years. <laughs> and yeah, the answer, maybe that comes in Glasgow. Hopefully. Um, dear panelists, um, in the meantime, I managed to get another five minutes for our session because uh, I think that we can agree that this is a fascinating debate and exchange of views. Um, so I got you five additional minutes for three persons and this means that now it's your turn to do my job and to give a short summary in one sentence. Uh, you can choose either a recommendation or just a conclusion. Tell us what is your final thought on this debate, on the question of our panel, maybe on the question of on whether we are doing our best or we are doing enough or not enough, uh, up to you. If you can make it in one sentence, that would be perfect. And uh, maybe let's start with Juliet. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I guess, I guess the for me the the, the solution to this is more, so, so the technological side, yeah, we can put more of our work into R&D and design, but the biggest solution, this is, this is a political and cultural um, question now. And, and the, the reason I, I talked about the BAFTA uh, report today, because uh, to be honest, politicians don't do anything unless the culture asks them to. So you have to have all everything aligned to be able to get a shift. Um, one of the things I remember when they brought, they banned smoking in pubs in the UK, which at the time uh, was, it felt like there was, there was a whole period of time where it felt like that was, that was never going to happen. The politicians were never going to do that. Um, but I think society went through the, as, as um, Onata talked about, or at the, the education piece, people understood it was beginning to affect their health. Uh, they understood uh, the economic piece, so it was really expensive. Um, and when the politicians actually came round to banning uh, smoking, 
it didn't feel people actually really accepted it. it there wasn't this big backlash that there, there was feared to be and i think for me the climate change debate is the same we need to take society and our culture along the route and our culture has grown up in a high carbon culture where we've been pushed towards consumerism and we've been pushed to, to towards consuming more fossil based products um, and we now need to go on a cultural journey as much as a political and technological journey that allows us to move to the solutions of climate change. And that is the piece that I'm beginning to see with Generation Z. And, and for me, I'm really excited about. Great. It was a little bit more than just one sentence, but <laughs> it was uh, very valuable. No, no. Um, thank you very much. Uh, maybe this time, Honorata, please. Uh, well, the short sentence, I would say um, encourage and educate. So encourage by different um, means. Uh, I think that financial market uh, has shown very well how you can uh, include uh, green goals into, um, I would say, different areas. Uh, um, so that's been translated to behavior of companies and we've seen it uh, as a translation of the SDGs into KPIs of, of uh, companies and actually companies uh, are rather willing to stick to that and uh, this is not the kind of greenwashing uh, as it's been uh, very often uh, depicted but it's really treated seriously uh, not, not as a part of C uh, and again, educate. Without education, um, I think that the um, change of behavior, um, of consumer uh, um, um, patterns of energy use, uh, that's not going to take place. Thank you. So we have a very strong emphasis on, on social questions, on culture, on education. Uh, I'm wondering what's the uh, point of Anthony? Thank you. Um, Maybe I should yeah, just mention the politics and the geopolitics, because I think we are, if there has been one advantage from, from COVID in terms of the climate negotiations, it has been that it delayed 26 by a year. And that has fundamentally changed the geopolitics because we had President Biden coming in and him rejoining Paris. We had the uh, Climate Leaders Summit in April when countries put forward more ambitious plans. So we are in a much stronger position than we would have been had COP not been delayed. And I just hope that that momentum can continue and that what we see within the next two months is not only national governments make pledges, we are waiting on China, India, Russia, et cetera, to do so, but also the private sector coming forward with more ambition and more uh, cooperation across the world. So. I'll leave on a, a note of optimism. I think we are in a much stronger position than we were a year ago, but there is still much to do and we need to take people with us. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, uh, Juliet Anthony, you cannot smell coffee that is just approaching in the room next door. <laughs> uh, but I would like to ask uh, the audience here to thank our panelists for this great inter interventions.